Here we are at the Constitutional Convention. It's the summer of 1787. What are we doing at this meeting? We are trying to revise the Articles of Confederation. And so our founding fathers are going to meet here to try to make some changes to that Articles of Confederation. So why did the founding fathers believe that the Articles of Confederation, which was our first type of government, needed to be replaced by a new constitution? Think about what we've talked about last week as far as the weaknesses in the Articles of Confederation. We know that they created a weak national government. We know that they had no power to tax. There was only one branch of government. And so all of these things, including Shay's Rebellion, uh, really triggered a need for a meeting to really try and change these Articles of Confederation. Are they going to be able to get change? It is at this meeting that we realize that we need 13 out of 13 votes in order to change the articles. And not all 13 states show up. Rhode Island is constantly um, absent. And so for, for this reason, we know that a change to the articles will not happen. And in fact, they're gonna get trashed and we're just going to have to start a whole new constitution. A couple of important vocabulary words Bicameral and unicameral, guys, and it's all relating to Congress. Bicameral means that Congress would be divided into two sections. We would have split Congress right in half, and we would have two different sections called the House of Representatives and the Senate. Unicameral means that we don't divide Congress. and said it's just one Congress all together without a, divi a division. Over the years, I've told my students to remember the word unicameral, kind of like a unibrow. When people have a unibrow, they only have one eyebrow that goes all the way across. You can think of Congress just as being one without a division. Unicameral meaning one, bicameral meaning two. Two more important words, proportional and equal representation. The P in proportional, guys, tie it into population because it basically means that representation in Congress, in other words, the amount of representatives are in Congress, should be based on a state's population. So the more people you have living in the, your state, the more representatives you should have in Congress. And if you have more representatives, then you have more of an influence, more of a say, because you'll have more votes in Congress when you're trying to pass certain laws. Equal representation would be the opposite. Equal basically says that it should not be based on population. Instead, every state should just have the same amount of representatives. Whether you're big or whether you're small, you should have the same amount. Each state should have two representatives that should go to Congress to make rules or laws or make the voting process. So again, what was wrong with the Articles of Confederation, that very first government? Number one, we didn't have the power to tax, and so we're going through a national debt crisis. Number two, political, we could not solve issues between the states. Everybody was arguing. Number three, social, we did not have the power to put down a civil uprising. So Shays Rebellion happens, the national government is weak, they have no national militia to go down there and put down the rebellion in Massachusetts. So all of these things point to the Articles of Confederation not being strong enough to lead the nation, and they're going to need to be changed. And so we have a couple of people such as James Madison and Alexander Hamilton that say, hey, let's have a meeting, let's call a convention. What are we gonna try to do, says, says Madison. Well, Hamilton says, we need to change the Articles of Confederation. And it's there at the meeting at the Constitutional Convention that they realize that they can't change it because they needed 13 out of 13 votes and Rhode Island never showed up. So Madison says, you know what, we're just going to have to write a whole new constitution. Let's scrap the articles and just start anew. Now at this meeting, there's going to be a lot of arguments and debate, guys. Uh, some of these arguments and debates will be over Congress and representatives. How many states get how many representatives? Um, should it be unicameral? Should it be bicameral? Should Congress be divided or not be divided? And another issue will be slaves. Will people that have slaves or states that have slaves be able to count their slaves towards their population so that they could have more representatives? 
there's going to be a huge debate here uh, and a lot of arguing going back and forth. But at the end of the day, there's going to be a compromise in which both sides or people with different views will be able to come to some sort of agreement for this new constitution. George Washington is here saying, let's all calm down because we know that George Washington is going to be the president of the Constitutional Convention. So Congress is going to be a huge debate. Number one, how should Congress be? Should it be one house? Should we divide it into two? On top of that, every state's going to get how many representatives? Should it be based on their population? Should everyone just get the same? And so they're arguing over this in the summer of 1787 at the Constitutional Convention. There is going to be two plans. The first plan is called the Virginia Plan. And this one really favored the larger states because they had more people. They said under the Virginia plan that Congress should be divided into two. We should have two houses in Congress divided into, into two sections. Representation should be based on the amount of people that live in each state. So it should be proportional representation under the Virginia plan. The other side, which is the New Jersey plan, this plan really favored the small states. They said that Congress should be just one house. It should be unicameral. We shouldn't divide it. And we should have equal representation. In other words, every state gets the same amount of representatives. It doesn't matter how many people actually live in your state. Now, one thing that these two have in common, however, they both agree, both the Virginia and the New Jersey plan agree that we need to have three branches of government. We need to include an executive branch and we need to include a judicial branch in this new constitution. So again, Virginia plan is going to favor the large states and have proportional representation. New Jersey plan is going to favor the small states and they're going to push for equal representation. So here's a good visual of that Virginia and New Jersey plan. Notice the Virginia plan. They're bigger. They have more check marks. They're basically saying we should have more representatives in Congress because we have more people. And because we have more people, we have more concerns and more opinions. So we have to have more representatives in order to voice the concerns and opinions of all of our population. New Jersey is over there with two little check marks and they're saying, no, that's not fair. Every state should have the same amount of representatives, whether you're big, you're small, you have a lot of people or you don't have a lot of people. Because if it was based on population, the New Jersey plan is basically saying, we're always gonna be outvoted because we're never gonna have a lot of people living in our states. So we're never gonna have a lot of representatives in Congress. And then the two little pictures on the bottom Virginia is represented by a rather larger person, and then New Jersey is represented by a rather smaller person because it basically captures that same idea that Virginia was for larger states and New Jersey was for smaller states. And so you have two questions here. How does the Virginia plan benefit? And how does the New Jersey plan benefit? So this argument over large and small states, Virginia plan or New Jersey plan, gets really intense, guys. And so somebody comes up with a plan. This is going to be Mr. Roger Sherman. He comes up with what is called the Connecticut plan, also known as the Great Compromise. And what Sherman basically said, well, if one of you wants proportional and the other one wants equal representation, why don't we just cut Congress in two? Let's divide Congress into two sections and one of them will be proportional representation and the other one will be equal representation. Easy, cheesy, peasy, said Roger Sherman. And that's really how Congress is today, guys. Congress is actually divided into two sections. We have the House of Representatives on one side of Congress and the representatives that go there are based on a state's population. In other words, if you have more people in your state, then you're going to have more representatives. And currently we have 435 representatives based on each state's population. And then in the Senate, which is the other side of Congress, we have equal representation. So it doesn't matter how big or small you are, every state will get two senators per state. And in order for any laws to pass, guys, it actually has to go through both of these sections of 
Congress. It has to go through the House and through the Senate in order for a law to get passed. So that means that they both have to eventually agree or um, it works out to where not one overpowers the other. So we're going to have to work out another compromise on top of the Great Compromise. This compromise, however, is going to be about slavery, guys. At the Constitutional Convention, we have both representatives or delegates from the southern states and the northern states. And are there differences between the north and the south? Yes, huge differences, economic differences. The south from the very beginning has relied on cash crops, plantation, agriculture. And because of that, they have a lot of slaves. The northern states, they don't rely so much on slavery. Instead, they make things. They're more about manufacturing. And so the South comes up with an idea and they say, you know what? If population is counted in the House of Representatives, if you have more people, you have more representatives, then we should be able to count our slaves towards our population in order to have more representatives in Congress. And the North is looking at them, are you, are you crazy? You don't even consider your slaves citizens, yet here you want to count them as population? The North didn't think it was fair. And so because both sides disagree, we had to come up with some sort of compromise. And the compromise that ends up being made is the three-fifths compromise. So it basically said out of every five slaves, the South would be able to count three of them, not all of them, three of them as population towards representation purposes in Congress. Was everybody happy about this? No. But again, when we're trying to reach an agreement or a compromise, something is always having, being had to give. You have to give something up, in other words. And so the North had to give in and the South had to give in. And so the three-fifths compromise, out of every five slaves, three of them would be counted. How does this compromise affect representation in Congress for the Southern state? Think about it. If you have more people, you have more representatives. And if the South is able to count their slaves, then they're going to have more representatives in Congress, which means they're going to have more influence because they're going to have more votes. So just to recap, which two compromises were reached at the Constitutional Convention in the summer of 1787, we got the Great Compromise that determined representation in Congress. It divided Congress into two. It gave one of them equal representation and the other proportional representation. And then we have the Three-Fifths Compromise that allowed the South to count three out of every five slaves as their population to have more representation in Congress.